Yeah, maybe just a few things. Um, so, one is the um, discussion uh, that exists between those who use the word commons and those who use the word common. And there is a difference, because when you say commons, you stress that there is a physical reality, a material reality to the commons. When you stress common, you stress the abstract principle of cooperation. And so this is something that, you know, you may choose your, your side in this debate. Um, but for me, I, I cite to the side of the commons because I think it's important to know that commons are real, pragmatic things. The danger of saying common is it becomes like, you know, uh, some kind of anti-neoliberalism. You have the principle of capital, which is bad, and then you have the principle of the common. Um, and so I feel that there's a, say, a certain danger to it because you, it either requires some kind of conversion, like, you know, it's you have to completely give up basically your, your life and, you know, so for me, it has this kind of religious and almost gnostic uh, undertone of, uh, you know, so the commons is pure, and so, but of course, you know, people make their choices. But I have this discussion, for example, within the common strategies group, with Silke all the time, where you know she stresses the use of the word common, uh, and the need for purity, and I stress much more the idea of being pragmatic, and to say it doesn't matter what you think, and, you know, as long as we can collaborate in the commons, we can abstract from our difference because we share a common love, right, for, for this object that we're making. So, as I said before, I think the, the commons is a object-oriented sociality, right, where it's kind of, your values are embedded in this thing you, you're making together. And that has all kinds of consequences for how you organize your community. Um, I mentioned in my personal interview <coughs> three days ago, one of my favorite authors is, I think his name is Keith Chandler, but it could be William Chandler, and the book is called Beyond Civilization. I just want to give you a little evolutionary theory um, that he brings forward. I, I like creators and I like evolutionary theory, so for me, these kinds of ideas are makes sense. So he basically links religion to class society. So in other words, before class society, in tribal cultures, you know, shamanistic, animistic spirituality is really global. So it's the same thing everywhere. It's connection with nature, with trees, with spirits. But once you have class society, he says, that's when you have tragedy. Suddenly, you're not living anymore with your uncles and, and, and aunts, but you're living as a slave, uh, as a serf, as a, you know, you have to go in the Roman legions and die for the emperor. Um, so life becomes tragic. And he says that's when religion, organized religion, emerges to give sense um, to the suffering in a class society. And that's... And he also said that's when civilization makes fundamentally different choices, right? So basically the way the scheme he uses is between chaos and order. And so he explains Christianity, Judaism and Islam as sociological religions. So there's chaos, you know, and according to the Bible and, and, and you know, God creates order into chaos. And that is good. So order is good, chaos is bad. So that's the Western way. And I think I mentioned it, you know, if you're a Christian, you have to be engaged. If you're a Buddhist, you have to say, I'm an engaged Buddhist, right? Because it's not, it's not inherent necessarily in the practice. We saw that in Thailand with the AIDS crisis, where most monks believed it was a punishment for bad behavior. It was bad karma, nothing we can do about it, you know, until they had 11% um, uh, eight sufferers in Chiang Mai, and then a small group of Buddhist monks said, "No, we have this. You know, we have to do something about it, right?" But they had to fight. It wasn't like a given for a monk to be engaged in a worldly pursuit, right? 
Well, of course they can use Buddhist language to do that, but it's not a given, that's what I'm trying to say. So within Buddhism you have, especially in Thailand, uh, what's his name, Buddha Daza, and, and so, you know, they were actually socialist Buddhists uh, at the time. You know, they, they were influenced by Marxism and they're trying to develop Buddhist theories. And you probably know these people like Apichai Puntasen, which used to be a friend of mine. I haven't seen him for years now, but this is Buddhist economics, right? They're looking back uh, at the writings of early Buddhists to see if that can inspire an alternative economics. So he basically he argues that the East is the opposite. In the East, order is illusion, and you have to go to no order, nirvana. Um, and so it's a completely different attitude to life. And I, I see this a lot in therapy, right? I, I wasn't feeling too well when I was young, so I went through a phase of doing California-style uh, uh, practices, human potential movement and stuff. And basically what you learn in the West is very, uh, very consistently, it's to take it in. Like, my emotions are not outside of me. I don't have emotions. I am my emotions. I am my relations. So it's about extending your ego to the other and to nature. And it's very fundamental as a, you know, as a way of thinking while... You know, I, I used to do quite a bit of meditation in my 20s and 30s, and it's exactly the opposite. Like, I am not my body. I am not my emotions, right? So this is, I think, a valuable insight uh, into these differences. And then he says, North is China, yin and yang in balance, the only civilization which honors both chaos and order. <coughs> and then he uses the Aztecs in the south of his grid. And as an example of a doubly negative uh, approach, because basically the world sucks and our gods suck as well, so we need to you know, give blood every day so that the gods don't, don't kill the world. And that's a very, very tragic view of life, right? It's, uh, and so of course if you're born into a class civilization, this is what you get. Um, and if that is true, and and religion is about class society, is about inequality. That means that once we start talking about equality and civil rights and universal human rights, that we are actually attempting to transcend civilization. So he talks about post-civilization. Uh, I, I really like that approach. Post-civilization is, first of all, when these different traditions start converging and merging. Yeah. So they're no longer separate. So, and this, I'm, I'm sure you can see this. You have, uh, you know, in Korea now, the majority of the people are Christian, not Buddhist, right? That's a clear import. Um, and in the West, we do yoga and tantra, and mindfulness is now a really big, big thing. And mindfulness is a secular adaptation of vipassana. So because we're more atheistic and, and stuff, so we don't want all the baggage. And mindfulness is basically a filtering out of some of the techniques without all the metaphysical, uh, you know, what, what some Western would call baggage. I not necessarily the case, but this is how people think about this, right? Uh, but so you can see how much mutual influence there is. Uh, so I, I was lucky enough in my 20s and 30s to actually go through these different spiritual paths. I feel that's an important enrichment of my life. Um, and so one of the debates, for example, I'll just briefly mention it, that, I, that was very important when I was young. For example, Jung says, you have to stay within your tradition, right? So if you were born in a Christian civilization, you have to work with the material of your Christian civilization. It's debatable, I didn't do it. I actually went to look elsewhere. But I did actually, after I did everything else, until I decided when I, later in the mid thirties to, to say, well, let's go to my own tradition. So I did a lot of, you know, I explored the esoteric tradition, the alchemy and Rosicrucianism and, you know, masonry. And, and so I was a Templar. So I did all these weird uh, Western uh, esoteric traditions. I don't know if you use that in Asia, but in the West, it's a very strong distinction, the exoteric and the esoteric, right? 
The exoteric is what you tell the people. And the esoteric is what you tell advanced spiritual people. For example, I read a book, I don't know if it's true, but this monk was saying, karma is just for the masses. Once you are an advanced meditator, we tell you that karma doesn't exist. I don't know if that's true, but that's what... So that's... If it was true, that would be the argument of, you know, esoteric versus exoteric, right? This... Um, so one of the things, of course, that is happening today is that it's not all in the open. I think this is a very important part of peer-to-peer, -peer, transparency, holoptism, is that suddenly we have access to everything. But it also means that we are going to transform and distort uh, a lot of traditions. I don't know how you feel about this, but, you know, when a Westerner talks about karma, it's, it's very different from here. Um, so I, you know, my wife is a Thai Buddhist and she's very devout, you know, she's more the popular Buddhism and she has a very negative view of karma. It's like, you know, I'll be reborn as a dog or something, you know, so uh, when you go to California, it's entirely different karma, you know, I'm working on my karma because my next life is going to be better, right? So. So these convergences are not neutral, they... So this is what happened, and this was very formative for my young years. So I was following uh, Rajneesh for a time, and if you ever have time, it's fantastic. It's, it's called Wild Wild Country, it's on Netflix, and it's five episodes of what happened in Rajneesh Puram in Oregon, where this community completely collapsed. And and reality beats any fiction you can imagine. It's unbelievable what was happening there. But this is also... <coughs> I think what happened is... You have these Eastern gurus. And in Eastern societies, they are socially controlled. You can't have sex, you can't have this, you can't have that, and everybody is looking at you. So maybe they do it in secret, which is what I heard, but they don't do it openly. Right, so, um, so you, and, and this is another discussion I have with my wife, you know, I, I, in Europe we tend to think transparency is good, and she says no, so she actually thinks hypocrisy is good. I find it very interesting, because think about it, so think about the Catholic Church and everything that's happening in the Catholic Church, you know, pedophilia and all these scandals. Well, 40 years ago, all these priests had maids, and everybody knew this, but nobody said anything, right? So in other words, because of the hypocrisy, they had an outlet. It was accepted that we're human, that, you know, and so once you get a society which judges you on that, you cannot, then you, you really force the underground. <coughs> so that's one of the theories of why, you know, why this is happening, right? Because, uh, so there was this spirit in the 70s, where you know, everything had to be in the open and there could be no hypocrisy and everything had to be authentic. So this puts a lot of pressure on people that in traditional societies you can paper over it. Like in Thailand it's that way. It's, if you haven't seen it, it doesn't exist. Can I tell you a little story about it? So if you're a prostitute in Thailand, um, so the men become monks so they can work on the karma for the family. Right? The woman cannot become monks because they say that the lineage died and only the Buddha can restart the lineage. So some Thai women who want to be monks go to Sri Lanka where there's still a lineage, but they're not recognized when they come back. You know, they're not uh, received with open arms, on the contrary. So one of the things that a young girl can do in a poor family is sacrifice herself, right? Go to Bangkok, do this job, and every year come back to the village, give a, give a diamond to the monks, and her karma is cleaned, and she can go for another year. Now, everybody knows this, but nobody says anything about it. So it's basically, as long as it's not said, it doesn't exist. But this makes for very tolerant societies that can tolerate, you know, I'm sure you can uh, critique this, but you know, these are, this is how it works there. So I have lots of discussions in my family about this. Um, okay, so so those four different ways 
of thinking about the world, and then the question is then becomes, if we do peer-to-peer, -peer, if we can permissionlessly congregate as equals, and you don't pay me, I don't pay you, and we have to engage in peer governance, like how do we are going to make this work if I'm not in a subordinate relationship to you? I think obviously that has influences how you see spirituality and religion, right? So if you're interested, I think you should look into John Heron, uh, who is in New Zealand, the Pacific Center for Spiritual in Inquiry, and then in California, at the California Institute of Integral Studies, you have Georgia Ferrer, and they are the founders of something called participatory spirituality. And it's basically about a critique on spiritual hierarchy, right? So their main argument is the following. If you're a Buddhist and you follow one of the schools, you're not free. Because what they will tell you is that this is not the true effect of medication. This is the true effect of medication. And there are like eight different interpretations of what Nirvana is, right? So this is not an open spiritual inquiry. I'm not saying it's bad, but it's, it's very much uh, directed, right? So there's a priori truth. That is that if you practice, you will find it. And, and there's a policing of the boundaries of that truth. So in this vision, you would critique that as being a hierarchical system of thought. So people like uh, Jorge Ferrer, what they say is, so let's have peer-to-peer -peer spiritual circles. Let's give us an injunction. An injunction is this year, we will work with a Taoist teacher. And we will follow his, his uh, training. But then after each exercise, we will discuss together what it meant for us. So does that make sense? It's a completely different view of looking at religion because it's totally open-ended. So it's basically building some kind of collective experience together. And so you do follow the rules. But the next year, they might invite a rabbi or a Sufi or... The important thing for these people is to have this open-ended... So they say there are many spiritual shores, right? There's not one mountaintop, uh, which is, you know, you know, the perennial philosophy, right? The perennial philosophy is this idea that all religions are really the same. A lot of people believe this. And if you listen to Chandler, you would say, no, they're not all the same. There's actually different destinations. It's not the same mountaintop, right? But they're fixated. So a peer-to-peer -peer approach could be um, that there's no, there's no pre-established path. And we meditate as equals. We do take experts, right? <coughs> and that's difficult. It's one of the big challenges in peer-to-peer -peer communities. It's how to mix horizontality and verticality. Uh, I'm a big critic of pure and horizontalism because it leads to lowest common denominator consensus. Yeah, I've, I've lived in a community like this. Uh, there was a malfunctioning toilet. We had meetings every so many weeks. And at the end of the meeting, always some older anarchists would say, but everybody has to care for the toilet, right? And nobody cared. So... Um, I lived in three communes when I was young, and they all failed about the dishes. So this is horizontality, verticality is a big challenge. And it's also the challenge of organizing a human community so that you can have expertise. Right? So this is a big, big challenge. And that includes spiritual expertise. Right? So, but I think the difference between before is, so these gurus came from the East, and Western people were very hungry for truth, and they didn't believe anymore in their old religious stories. And for these gurus, they came into Europe, and there was no social control. So you know the stories about Chogya and Trumpa, you know, they all had, you know, several dozen girlfriends, and they had AIDS, and they just kept on going, and, you know, so a lot of damage was done in this period. I'm talking about the 70s and 80s, and that was an important shift in Europe and uh, so now it's much less so. It's much more difficult for a guru to be that way. But when I was young, this was the way. Like, we didn't know. 
And so there's also a way of looking at spirituality as abundance and scarcity, right? So back one, Rajneesh would say, I am the way, right? So if you are the way, I'm dependent on you, right? So a lot of spirituality is based on the idea of scarcity, and there's a portal, and the guru is the portal. And as opposed to, you know, you could say we all have wisdom, and let's discover it together. That would be an entirely different way of looking at spirituality in a peer-to-peer -peer way. So I'll just conclude with, this is not really spiritual, but the way that we solve this in the P2P Foundation is that we consider ourselves as a collective organic intellectual. So the idea is that no person you know, has the truth, but the more light you shed from different perspectives, the more you eliminate the object, right? <coughs> and it's a big question, because for example, there are today very few public intellectuals. I don't know if you noticed. They're all old and they're not being renewed. Uh, and it's because probably a, a, the internet has a big, big role to play. And one of the issues is time, right? If, you, if you're Marx, you can go for years in the public library and you, know, you can write many books today. I need a whole day just to, to monitor events and to communicate with my network and to build. You know, all these things take so much time that even as an intellectual, it's, it's very difficult to build this kind of you know, generic knowledge, right? So, so the thing is, of course, if you're in a community, you can start uh, organizing yourself so that there are diverse and complementary visions that together, um, so that's how we see ourselves, right? We are thinking together. I'm, you know, to be honest, I'm still the, <laughs> the most important one in the group because I take time to do that and the others less so. But, but in principle, this is our idea. So it's about uh, basically, you know, uh, together. So uh, I think it was Tichat Nan who wrote a, uh, an article where he said, the next Sangha will be a collective. Yeah, and I also wrote an essay that was very similar you can find it on the internet where I said the next Buddha will be a collective. So a very similar idea that not to look at a person with the truth, but to look at communities building the truth together. All right. Um,